Turn with me, if you would. My topic is a curse for us, the death of Christ. Turn with me to Mark's account of the death of Jesus, the gospel according to Mark chapter 15 and at verse 33. Mark chapter 15 and verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. The symbol of Christianity principally is not a fish or a hammer or a carpenter's chisel, but a cross, an instrument of torture and pain, of civil execution and death. We are here in a dark place. We are listening to words of immense grief and pain, the meaning of which eludes us. Joel Niederhood says, The question, why have you forsaken me, is unanswered because the subject is too sacred for our ears. We couldn't comprehend it. Jesus has been hanging on this cross for three hours, from nine in the morning until noon. The crowds are gradually leaving. Their curiosity has been satisfied. And several things are now mentioned in some brevity by Mark. The first of which is the darkness at midday. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, from noon until three. At his birth, there was brightness at midnight. At his death, there is darkness at noon. It is as though the sun was ashamed to look upon him 
and refused to give him warmth and comfort and light. The darkness is meant to symbolize perhaps several things. The chaos that characterized the world before the creation of light in Genesis 1 and verse 2. The disintegration of all things. Or perhaps it's meant to remind us of the tenth, that before the tenth plague came upon Israel during the time of the Exodus, the ninth plague, the plague of darkness that lasted for three days and three hours here. Or perhaps those familiar with the Old Testament would be reminded of the words of the prophet Amos in chapter 8 and verse 9, in that day I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight, a depiction that in part was about the judgment at the end of the age in all of its eschatological breadth and scope, and perhaps there is a little glimpse of it and a hint of it here at Calvary. And it covers the whole land, the Greek here, gay, which can, can also mean earth. Was this an eclipse? No, since it lasts for three hours. God did this. It was a miracle. In the definition Dr. Sproul gave earlier this morning, God put his hand across the sun and said, You shall not pass. Some of you got it. <laughs> God did it. to signal the exodus of the people of God, the slaying of the Passover lambs to mark the doorposts of the houses of the people of God as the angel of, of death passed through the land, and the howls and cries of parents were heard in the streets of the cities of Egypt. This is judgment time. This is a part of the wrath of God. Christ, our Passover, is being slain for us. His blood sprinkled as the angel of death now passes over. Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut its glories in when God the mighty Maker died for his own creature's sin. Thus might I hide my blushing face while His dear cross appears, dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt mine eyes in tears." Isaac Watts. The darkness. And then secondly, the cry, the cry of dereliction, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? quotation from the 22nd Psalm. It's interesting to ponder what's going on in the mind of the Lord Jesus, the human mind of the Lord Jesus, who had spent his entire life pondering, learning, 
the Scriptures, living his life in obedience to the Word of God. And what Scripture comes to mind now here in the darkness of Calvary but the 22nd Psalm? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Silence and darkness for three hours, and then at three o'clock, my God, my God. Some thought he was calling for Elijah, a Jewish expectation at the time of Passover, the empty seat that was kept for Elijah's coming, the closing prophetic words of the prophet Malachi. There's nothing to guide us here as to what these words mean. There's nothing in our experience that comes remotely close to this. We can't approach this passage of Scripture and say, what is this saying about me? This is entirely about Him. There are levels at which we must try and attempt to ponder and fathom this morning. He is the God-man and is a son in the eternal sense, in the ontological sense. There never was a time when the son was not. He had always been the Son of God. Even in His incarnation, He was the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He has this unique relationship with His heavenly Father. He is equal with the Father and with the Spirit in His essence, equal in power and in glory. He is just as much God, as the Father is God, as the Holy Spirit is God. He is also distinct from the Father, a He to whom He relates with the Father as you. Within that one God, there is differentiation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternal communion. Perichoresis, circumincessio, Greek, Latin, the dance of the Trinity with unique properties, with unique roles, the Father begetting, the Son begotten, the Son, the Holy Spirit proceeding, each person of the Trinity with his own unique, distinctive attribute, the Son as eternally begotten. And in the human mind of the Lord Jesus, a consciousness that He is divine. Theologians differ as to an explanation for that divine consciousness. Is that divine consciousness part of the hypostatic union? Is it, putting it more crassly, is it His divine nature witnessing to His human nature that He is the divine Son of God? Or as in the Reformed tradition, generally speaking, that that divine consciousness that Jesus had in His human nature was a consciousness imparted to Him by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He had to believe that He was the divine Son of God. Because He is also human, having been conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit, and throughout all the course of His life upheld and gifted and ministered to by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming upon Him in that symbolic fashion at the time of His baptism, 
Even now, Hebrews 9 tells us that in His death, He gave Himself by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now He's citing Psalm 22, no longer with words that suggest that He is conscious of His relationship to His heavenly Father, not my Father, my Father, as though the consciousness of His native sonship has has been obliterated, as though the darkness has hidden from His human consciousness that realization of His identity as the divine Son of God. Because here upon the cross, He cannot say, Abba, Father, but my God, my God, a frail, dependent creature forsaken by God. A movie of the crucifixion cannot convey what's going on here, nor could those who simply witnessed it with their eyes understand and comprehend what's going on here. We need a word of explanation. We need to try and unpack what it is that our Lord is saying when He's citing Psalm 22 with some deliberation. It doesn't mean that the Father wasn't there. It doesn't mean that the Father wasn't helping Him supplying His Spirit in mysterious ways to support Him even in the overwhelming flood. It is by the Spirit that He offered Himself without spot to God. But Jesus at this moment upon the cross does not seem to be drawing any help or comfort from His consciousness of His divine Sonship, because He seems at this point to be unaware of it. Clouds have descended to obscure that relationship. There is more here than an expression of how He feels. This citation of the psalm is deliberate. There is reality here. He is experiencing an abandonment of God in the depths of his soul. From the Father's point of view, never did he love his Son more than he does now. And yet, He is the subject of His abandonment. He is forsaken. Calvin puts it this way, if Christ had died only a bodily death, it would have been ineffectual. Unless His soul shared in the punishment, He would have been the Redeemer of bodies alone. At no point is the unity of the Trinity threatened here. But in the divine human Jesus, there is only a consciousness now of abandonment by His heavenly Father, as though He had been cast out, outside the city and outside of God, forsaken, in the place of weeping and of gnashing of teeth, 
under covenant anathema. We need the help of the Apostle Paul to pour some meaning into this. When Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. God made him to be sin for us. So here on the cross of Calvary, sin, the sins of God's people, the sins of God's elect are being reckoned, imputed to the Lord Jesus, who knew no sin, who had never sinned, who had no original sin, and had never violated or broken God's law, but had kept it perfectly and absolutely in His active obedience, rendering a righteousness that was spotless and pure. And now upon the cross, He is reckoned, as Luther says, the greatest sinner the world has ever seen. Or when Paul speaks in Galatians 3, 13, Christ was made a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. He is being reckoned a covenant breaker as one who has broken the terms of the covenant. And the wrath of God, the curse of God, is coming down upon Him. And He is being reckoned by God as a cursed thing, and one from whom God the Father must withdraw by the instinct, the reflex of His holy character that cannot look upon sin and cannot be in the presence of sin, and whose instinct is to withdraw so that the Lord Jesus is outside in the place of the wicked damned. This in part, and I don't want to raise this so as to cause some difficulty on your part, but this in part is what is meant by the descent into hell clause in the Apostles' Creed. He descended into hell. Now, leaving aside the issue for a moment as to whether that implies that between the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, there was a, an act in which Jesus went and proclaimed His victory over sin and death and the grave and hell and Satan himself, leaving that part of it aside for a minute. And moving back from the death of Jesus to the point at which He is on the cross, and He is citing the words of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why are you, have you forsaken me? He is experiencing hell. What is hell but the consciousness of the withdrawal of the covenant mercy of God. What is hell but to be on the outside? Never to know that warmth and integration of the purpose for which God had created us. He's made sin for us. He's cursed for us. Now, 
Now, this raises a theological question, and it is perhaps in part the greatest and most difficult question that you can ever ask. Why did the wrath of God alight here upon His beloved Son? Twice, twice the voice of the heavenly Father had been heard at His baptism, at His transfiguration. This is my beloved Son, and I love Him. Twice his father had come to him and reassured him, yes, reassured Jesus in his human nature with a human mind and a human affection and a human psychology and a human body. And twice the father had come to reassure him in his role and capacity as, as the mediator, you are my son and I love you. but not here. No voice was heard in the darkness. No reply was given to the agonizing question of the Lord Jesus, and we must ask the question, why does the wrath of God alight here on the sinless one? on the covenant keeper, on the law keeper, in whom there was no sin, no deviation, no spot, no blemish, no wrinkle, or any such thing. This is a scary moment. We, we need to understand that. We're not playing games here. These are not philosophical mind games. We're not playing the silly games that postmodern professors do when they have a sabbatical and they go away and they write books saying there is no objective truth. And then they come back into a class and a student comes up to them, a young girl comes up to the professor and says that during his absence she was raped. And everything within him cries out, this is wrong! And he can't play his silly mind games anymore because there is something objective about this. We're not playing mind games here. Why does the wrath of God alight here on the sinless one? There are only two answers. Tell me if there's a third answer. Answer number one is there is no justice in the world. There is no justice in the world. Suck it up. The wrath of God can alight anywhere without cause, without reason. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the bolt of lightning may come and strike you down irrespective of justice or obedience, even sinlessness. It may alight upon His own Son. Because God is irascible, He's unpredictable, He's given to fits of temper and anger like the Greek gods. That's one answer. There's no justice in the world. That's a scary thought, isn't it, for a theist? You may live in perfect obedience to the law of God and never commit an act of sin in thought, word, or deed, and the wrath of God can still get you. Or 
Or there's another answer. That this is precisely what Jesus deserved. At the point where the wrath of God alights, it is exactly, it is precisely what Jesus deserves. Because at that moment, the sins of His people have been reckoned legally to His account. And He is the greatest sinner the world has ever seen in, in a covenant of redemption from before the foundation of the world. In the plan of redemption between the Father and the Son, there had been this holy agreement that sinners would be saved through His substitution and satisfaction. And now it has reached the zenith of that covenant agreement, and the mediator is now reckoned to be sin for us, and the wrath of God comes down. And the felt presence of His warmth and embrace is taken away, and He is in darkness with no consciousness of His Father's love and support. But only the sense that He has been utterly and completely abandoned, and He is in darkness. God judged Him. God gave His own Son hell for a moment, and He tasted it in all of its bitterness and gall. And the words of Psalm 22 come to his mind, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yes, I, I think it's possible that Jesus isn't just citing the psalm from memory, but that the question, the why, is a real question because in his human mind he cannot fathom it. That something is happening that is beyond even his human mind to grasp. This is not cosmic child abuse. This is not cosmic child abuse. The wrath was deserved. That's what substitution does, do you see? He is bearing the punishment that sin deserves, and He's bearing it voluntarily. He had agreed to this. It was part of the agreement in the covenant of redemption that He would do this. And though now in His human nature He may have lost touch with some of the realities of what that means by way of comprehension, because He's a man, in His divine mind. And here is the mystery. Here is the mystery. In His divine mind, He concurs with it all. And He's saying, Father, this is what we agreed to. This is what it meant, isn't it? When I said I would become the covenant mediator and the substitute for sinners. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you understand, of course you do, if you're a Christian, you understand all too well 
that Jesus utters these words so that you and I, in union and communion with the Lord Jesus, will never have to utter those words, ever, ever, ever. That on that day of judgment, the wrath of God will never alight upon me because my sin has been dealt with. Justice has been met and met to the full. It has been satisfied in the obedience and substitution of the Son. There is a green hill far away outside a city wall where my dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. And the us there, I think, is those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the treasure of it. That's the comfort of it. He died for me. He died in my room. He died in my place. He took the wrath so that I can, I can receive grace at the end of a service of worship. There's a benediction. If you don't have a benediction at the end of your worship service, find another one. <laughs> it's vitally important theologically and experientially. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace, wholeness, integration, a sense of purpose. Because that's not what Jesus heard here at three o'clock on that Friday afternoon. He heard something else. The Lord curse you and push you away the frown of God's holiness come down upon you and give you hell. That's what he heard. He got hell so that we get shalom and peace and benediction. That's the assurance at the end of every worship service. We go forth with the shalom of God protecting us, the substitutionary atoning work of the Lord Jesus that satisfies divine justice surrounds me every moment of the day now and forever, throughout all eternity. Well, there are two more things. And briefly, the first one is the tearing of the temple curtain in two. You see that in verse 38, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom to the top as though a human being had done it, but from the top, and the top of the curtain was much taller than any human individual or a human standing on the shoulders of another could reach. This is a divine act of God. There's some discussion as to which curtain of the temple is in view, the outer curtain or the inner curtain, and that's an interesting thing to talk about and, and, and debate over. And I think it depends on which day of the week it is as to which one I take. <laughs> I rather think that it is the inner curtain rather than the outer curtain, though there are good arguments for saying it is the outer curtain. But for my part, I think it is the inner curtain, partly because of what is said in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10 for another occasion. 
But what is the meaning of it? The curtain that had separated the outer from the inner, the curtain that had separate where the people met and where sacrifice was offered and the holy presence of God in the temple, which was which was kept, as it were, away from the people by this visual, physical symbol of a curtain that now has been torn apart. And the glory, at least in part, of what the rending of this curtain signifies is what's at the heart of the Reformation, and it was at the heart of, of, of Luther's theology, the priesthood of all believers that no longer do we need intermediaries, and no longer do we need the, the blood of bulls and calves and heifers and, this, and, and, and so on, but, but by the blood of Christ once offered, once offered, a hapax. We have access into the very presence of Almighty God where the Shekinah glory itself was manifested. And, and never are we to experience that separation and darkness, if you will, but we have access to the very Holy One, and we can call the only God there is, Abba, Father. And then there's a fourth thing, and it's the response of the centurion there in verse 39, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, and he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Again, it is, it is possible in a Roman culture for a centurion who had seen it all, had seen many a crucifixion, and he was in charge of this crucifixion, had heard the narrative earlier when Jesus was stripped of His clothing and a crown of thorns was put on His head and a purple robe, and He was mocked and jeered as He made His way to Calvary. And the centurion was there overseeing every aspect of the crucifixion, the nailing of the nails into his hands and feet, the hoisting of the cross into its, into its place, and listened to him as he uttered those seven last words from the cross, and heard him cry at the darkness of three in the afternoon, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had Notice the way in which he had breathed his last, giving himself, even in death, he gave himself as an offering on behalf of sinners. Yes, it's possible that in a Roman culture, the Son of God meant no more than that he was holy and perhaps different from others. But Mark is the one who's telling you this story. Mark is the one who's saying, you know, there was a hardened Roman soldier, centurion, who'd seen many crucifixions, perhaps hundreds of them. And there was something about this one that was so, so different, and it moved him. It moved him in his own soul. And I think, I think that Mark is saying something happened in the heart and spirit and soul of this centurion that he came to new life. That there at the foot of the cross, as a little symbol of the power that this cross can effectuate, he was born again of the Spirit of God. And he cries, truly this was the Son of God, the altogether lovely one and fairer than 10,000. Oh, my dear friends, 
The cross is everything. We preach Christ and Him crucified. At the cross, we find our justification. At the cross, we find our forgiveness. At the cross, we find new life. At the cross, we find assurance that He loves us. He loves us that much. The Father loves us that much that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You've heard this many times before, I'm sure. I have nothing new to say to you. The question this morning again is, do you know this Savior? Do you really know Him? Is He your Lord and Savior and prophet and priest and King? Because without Him, this darkness, this overwhelming darkness of the holiness of God will alight upon you one day, on the day of judgment. So you must run to Him. You must bow before Him. You must ask Him to be your Lord and Savior and prophet and priest and King, because He says to you, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Father, we thank You. Thank You for the cross of Calvary. Thank You for the cursed death of the Son, that we might know covenant mercies and covenant blessings and the shalom of the gospel. Help us to rejoice in it now, that our hearts and souls and affections would be full and overflowing as we think about it, for Jesus' sake. Amen.